Shabbat Shalom. All right. I want to open up today with a little bit of insight from Charles Spurgeon. And this is what he says. My, soul, my own soul's conviction is that prayer is the grandest power in the entire universe. That it has a more omnipotent force than electricity, attraction, gravitation, or any other of those secret forces which men have called by name, but which they do not understand. In other words, Spurgeon is saying there is no other force or power in existence that even compares to prayer. There is nothing like it. it is the most powerful force in existence. That is a true statement. And it's really interesting to me how today and we see men laboring diligently to harness the power of electricity. And all the things that we do to go through that, to make it happen, because we recognize the benefits. We recognize the benefits of electricity and having power. It does so much for us, and we're willing to do so much to get it. But yet today, the Christian church is not willing to access the greatest power the world has ever known, the power of prayer. It goes completely abandoned. We are in a generation where we are spending more time looking at our phones. We're spending more time in front of the television. Could you imagine if you just stopped watching the hours of TV, if in fact you do that, or the hours of scrolling through senseless nonsense, playing on your phone with senseless games, that it's all pure worthlessness. Could you imagine if you just spend the same time on prayer and what that would look like and how that would transform your family, how that would transform you, and how that would affect the church at large? It'd be incredible. It'd be absolutely incredible. Think of how it would impact marriages. For the kingdom. See, but today we simply don't value it. We don't value it the way the apostles valued it in the first century. See, that's why when I read the book of Acts and I look at the church that we read about there, the things that they had spoken, the things that they were doing, and the things that were happening, the power being unleashed, we don't see that today. The church looks very different than the church I read about in the book of Acts. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to talk about prayer and fasting. But we're going to do something very important today. It's a little bit different. We're not just going to talk about prayer. We're going to bring the element of fasting in, and we're going to lock prayer up with fasting. See, because when you go to the Word, and you start looking at all the times where these two things link up, where they lock shields of prayer and fasting, I'm going to tell you, it's end-of-the-world type of stuff. Specific moments in time where men and women, righteous men of God, righteous women of God are being presented with situations that are impossible until they link prayer with fasting. Then the impossible becomes very possible. These are life-altering, defining moments. Go through your word and you'll see it. Now, I say these things because we have to, you, have a, you need a fire lit under you. To desire, a need to desire these things. See, bottom line, I'm going to tell you this. You can do a, a, a little audit of how you spend your day. And I'm going to tell you right now, primarily, you are doing what you want to do. You will fill your day through things of which you value. If you value spending time with your spouse, you will do that. If you value your TV, you will do that. If you value looking uh, at Facebook for hours at a time, you will do that. Whatever you value, I will find it. I will know because that's where you're spending your time. We need to start valuing prayer and fasting because of the generation we're living in more than anything. Prayer is relationship with Yeshua. This has to take precedence over everything. Amen? I want to, before we get into today's message, I want you to have an image in your mind. It's an image to help you understand the relationship that exists between prayer and fasting. Because there is a very beautiful, very important relationship. And the way I want to explain this is this way. When we look at this diagram, we're all familiar with the sun. We're all familiar with the earth. This is going to be very simple. And I've labeled the sun fasting and the earth prayer. 
The earth drinks in the heat of the sun. The earth absorbs the sun's light. And in that process, we got all these plants on planet earth. They grab that light and 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 they, they, they have, we have this process of photosynthesis and they literally turn that sunlight into energy. It turns it into power. And the byproduct of that whole thing is oxygen. It's life. And this is an amazing thing because this is what fasting does to prayer. It gives it power and the byproduct will be life. So as the sun complements the earth, so fasting complements prayer. All right? With that said, I want to open up today. We're going to go back in history. One of the most important, in my opinion, one of the most important documents we have today is known as the Moratorium Fragment. How many of you heard of the Moratorium Fragment? It's an ancient Christian document. Going back to the second century, Okay, it is as important, hands down, as the Didache. And you've been going through the Hebrews with me, so you know how important that document is. This is an ancient Christian document. What makes this thing so priceless is not just its antiquity, it's what it contains. It actually is one of the earliest recordations of a canonical list of, of, of epistles, of them looking at, hey, we identify uh, this epistle, this epistle, this epistle as profitable, as good for doctrine. Amazing. Absolutely priceless. And almost all the New Testament books that we have today in the New Testament are actually listed there. There's a few exceptions. It's incredible, but it gets better than that. This moratorium fragment contains commentary on these epistles, on these various books. I want to take you, I want to show you one example. And this comes from the Moratorium Fragment, that old ancient Latin document. The fourth gospel is by John. Okay, like I said, it's listing all the books that they approve of, that these are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, all that good stuff. The fourth gospel is by John, one of the disciples. When his fellow disciples and bishops encouraged him, John said... Fast along with me three days from today. And whatever may be revealed to each, let us relate it one to another. Now this is an amazing thing. The first thing that you need to recognize is this. The apostles, this is the testimony. The apostles, when they wanted supernatural revelation from on high, when they wanted God to communicate to them, the answer was fasting. It was fasting. Let me take this a step further. It goes on and says this. The same night it was revealed to Andrew, one of the apostles, that John in his own name should write down everything and that they should all revise it. Do you understand what was just said? In other words, what it just said is that um, the book of John that we have today was a product of fasting. And you think about that. You think about the importance of fasting. You think about the fruit that it produces, the life that it gives, not to one generation, but to generation after generation to where we're almost 2,000 years after the, after the marker of this. I mean, that's incredible. That is the power of prayer and fasting. Just one example. Let me give you another We're going to go back to Jonah. We looked at the story of Jonah last week, but we're going to look at it in a little different light. In Jonah 3, 1, we read, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach preach to it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. One of the most critical pieces to this entire story is right here. In fact, you will not appreciate this story the way it ought if you don't understand what was just said. Notice what it doesn't say. Let's talk about that. It doesn't say, yet in 40 days, I might, I maybe am thinking about, it could be, it might take place, I might destroy you. I haven't decided yet. What does this say? Literally, the Lord has declared, I'm coming to kill you. The Lord has resulted in his heart and he has spoken it. This is the word of the Lord. You're going to die. 
you will be destroyed. Now think about that. This is a statement. This is a declaration. This is not a maybe. It might. He has declared you are going to die. Interesting, as we continue, how do the people of Nineveh respond? Well, we read, so the people of Nineveh, oh, they believed God. Now, you think about something. That statement that we just looked at where Jonah's going forth, he's declaring judgment against God. Let's be clear, that is not Jonah's mouth. Those are not his words. He is simply conveying exactly the word of the Lord. And so what I want you to understand is as he's going through, they're going through their sheets, he's declaring the word of the Lord. Nineveh has two options. You either believe the word of the Lord or you reject the word of the Lord. There's no middle ground here. You either believe it or discount it. Isn't it interesting? Well, you remember Lot's son-in-laws? Remember Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah? His son-in-laws, he went and told them God is bringing judgment Yet his son-in-laws thought he was joking. They didn't take them serious. They didn't believe. And what was the outcome? They were killed. They were destroyed. They didn't believe the word. And what I'm telling you right now, as you look at this word, and we have the word of God, Genesis through Revelation, you got two options. You either believe it or you reject it. Well, let's continue in the story and let's see the benefits. Now, the first thing I want to say here is as we continue, it says, so the people of Nineveh believe God. How did they respond? Faith. We call this faith. What does faith look like? Uh, They proclaimed a fast. That's what faith looks like. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word uh, also came to the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and do what? Cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. It's amazing. They believed, they moved in faith, and what did they start doing? They started fasting, and what is crying mightily to God? Praying. This is what, this was the answer to God's certain judgment. A declared judgment, not a maybe. This is the way they moved, and they turned from their wicked ways. So this fasting and prayer, it included the right heart, a heart of humbleness, a penitent heart saying, I'm no longer going to continue in these sins. It's not okay. And we continue on, we read verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Listen to this. Then God saw their works. He saw their works. He saw it. He saw the fruit of their works. And there's no more tangible expression to repentance than that of praying and fasting. It's tangible. He saw the works that they turned away from their evil. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Do you want to know the power of prayer and fasting? It actually staved off. It it held back the hand of God. It held back judgment. It actually changed the heart of the Lord. The Lord was resolved in his heart. I'm coming to destroy you. But because of what they did, of going to prayer, of going to fast, and turning from their wicked ways, God changed his plan. Now that is ultimate power. This is the power of praying and fasting. So in your own life, How do you think this could apply? When you know you haven't been walking with the Lord, when you know you've been rebelling with him, you know you're not in relationship, you're more in relationship with the world than you are with Yeshua. The way to come home is right here. This is how we can assure that the judgment, that we're going to avoid judgment, that we're not going to 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 face that. It's by following these principles right here. Prayer and fasting is something that God demands as you return to him. And I only say this because this is what the prophets say. We read in Joel 2.12. 2, now therefore says the Lord. Turn to me with all your heart. With what? With fasting. With weeping. And with mourning. The prophets are crying out. It's the word of the Lord. What does the Lord want? 
Do you ever wonder why your flesh fights you so hard? Your flesh is the antithesis to the spirit. It fights against the spirit every step of the way. It wants nothing to do with obedience to God or God's heart or God's desire. So there's a good chance if you don't want to do something, that might be of God. And we test all things, amen, with, with scripture. But that's the point. So he says, turn to me with, with fasting, with weeping. And then he goes on in verse 13, rend your heart. Now you look at this, and I didn't put it up here, but you look at this word in the Hebrew, kara. It means tear. Tear your heart, not your garments. Now you can go through the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, and what you'll see is time after time, there's so many examples of good, righteous men of God. They're tearing their garments. And it was, it was in, in accordance with great sorrow, great mourning, great pain. You would tear, and it was even affiliated with fasting. And so people would go, and you, you got to put this in context. You know, you go back to biblical times, really one of the most important things you possessed, any person possessed, was their garment. It was a massive sacrifice to tear the garment because you're rendering it null and void. You're rendering it useless. So when you tear your garment, you have destroyed what you value most. And it's interesting. God says, don't do that. I want your heart. I want inside here. I want you to love me. I want you to seek me. Tear that. Because, you know, it's not your cloak. It's not your garment, which you're housing all your idols. It's your heart. That's where we house these idols. Now he goes on and he says this, Return to the Lord your God. Why? For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Notice the fact that that term is used, that he relents, means he was resolved in his heart to come for you and to take you out, to judge you. But he is merciful and compassionate. He can be changed. His heart can be changed depending on your actions. Depending on if you go to him and pray and fast. And depending if you have a repentant heart. Depending if you want to abandon your idols and all the things of the world. This is absolutely critical. He is gracious and merciful. He is a merciful, loving father. He wants to love us. But he's also a righteous God. Deuteronomy 9.18, we looked at this. We're going to look at it differently today. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first, 40 days, 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. This is Moshe. Moses, he is fasting. Why? This is what's amazing. The text tells us why he fasted. What does it say? It says this. He goes on, because of all your sin which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now here's a perfect example of beautiful intercession by the most humble man that was on the face of the earth. We know this for a fact, Numbers 12. Most humble man on the face of the earth. He goes to intercede on behalf of Israel. They had sinned. God had resolved in his heart to wipe them out. And Moses goes, but why does he pray and fast? Because to hold off judgment. The very thing that these men of Nineveh did is exactly what Moses did on behalf of his own brethren. Power to hold off judgment, prayer and fasting. My goodness, for how many, if, you, if you're honest with yourselves, you know how much, how immersed some of you are in sin. What a fantastic avenue. This is protocol. This is protocol. I want to take you to 2 Chronicles. And this is... This is one of my favorite stories, and for multiple reasons, but this story encompasses the totality of this entire series, of looking at the principles of prayer, applying them, of looking at the reality of fasting, applying it. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1, we read this, And it happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon, and others with them, besides the Ammonites, uh, came to battle against Jehoshaphat, or Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria. And they are in Hazazon, Tamar, which is En Gedi. Verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared. Understand something. Jehoshaphat saw this army. He knew what was coming for him. And he knew there was no chance of survival. In the physical realm, this is an impossible situation. He cannot come out on top on this thing. 
And now he's blanketed in fear. He's staring at, at death straight in the face. Now, I know all of you, to some degree, can absolutely relate to this. You have your own version of this story. Something has happened in your life, some trial, some tribulation has come into your life and you are literally suffocating with fear. You've been gripped with fear because you're looking at the situation going, it's impossible. There's no way out of this. It might be financial. You might be in such a financial mess, you have no idea what to do. It could be health. Could be your health. The doctor could say, you know what, I'm sorry. You have cancer. I'm sorry, you have this other diagnosis. I'm sorry, I don't even know how to diagnose you. I'm sorry, there's no cure. We can't do anything for you. You know how many times a day that happens to people? Even little baby Israel right now is sitting up in the hospital and the doctors are baffled. They're not sure what's going on. And so what happens is, is you're looking at this when men are telling you the situation is hopeless. We don't know. We don't have an answer. Sometimes they're sending me. I mean, I've talked to a gentleman who was literally sent home with six weeks to live. The doctor says, there's nothing more we can do for you. Understand, you have your version of Jehoshaphat. You want to pay attention to this story. Because this is where power comes in. So how does Jehoshaphat respond to the situation? He set himself to seek the Lord. And what's he do? He proclaims a fast throughout all Judah. Protocol for life and death situations. Prayer and fasting. Seek the Lord with all your heart. This is where we need to be. Joseph had needs a miracle. How many of you in your life have needed a miracle? How many people do you know need miracles? I mean, every hand should be up. We know someone. It's tangible. This, this entire country is sick with disease. It's riddled. Continuing on, verse 4. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Yehuda they came to seek the Lord. In verse 5, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Yerushalayim, in the house of the Lord before the new court. In verse 6, And said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Now isn't this interesting? This is the beginning of Jehoshaphat's prayer. Does this sound familiar? Our father who art in heaven. Jehoshaphat, as he's opening up his prayer, are you not God in heaven? And then listen to what he says. Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Your kingdom come, your will be done. See, what's being conferred, trans, uh, translated in, the, in, in that uh, prayer, what the Lord is telling us, there's no other kingdom that is greater than the Lord's kingdom. Your kingdom will come, and it will be done. There, all the other kingdoms will fall. And this is Jehoshaphat, he's exalting the Lord. He is reminding the Lord of what he believes, that he has ultimate power. He is not limited in any way. And in your hand, is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? Verse 7, are you not our God, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwelt in it. And have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple. And what do we do? We will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. Now you have to, to appreciate this, and even on a deeper level, do you know what Jehoshaphat just did? He literally just quoted scripture. See, because you can go back to 1 Kings 8 with his great-great-grandfather, Solomon. Solomon had an experience with the Lord where Solomon prostrated himself. He said a prayer of dedication. And in that prayer of dedication, he went through all these various scenarios of what could befall Israel. But if Israel turns back to you, including in a time of war... And they turn to this temple and they call upon your name. Then please hear in heaven. Solomon prays this prayer. It's the word of the Lord. It's been recorded. Jehoshaphat is calling upon that word. And the end of that, that prayer that Solomon prayed. The Lord says, I shma. I 
heard. I have heard, meaning I have agreed. Now that is powerful because again, it is teaching us how to pray. It is teaching us how to fast. In other words, we start praying the Lord's word. You pray the word of the Lord and you remind him of his promises saying, have you not said, Lord, this is what you have said. You stand on those promises in faith. This is where we have to be. And we do not doubt. We cannot be double-minded. Amen? All right. Going to verse 10. Verse 10 says, And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not uh, let Israel invade. When they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them, here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. Verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? Now listen to this. For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. How many situations have you been in? You're looking at this going, I don't have a chance. I have no power. I can't fix this. There's nothing I can do. Jehoshaphat in his prayer reminds the Lord he can't do it, but he knows who can. Now, what's interesting is in addition to this statement, it gets worse. He goes on to say, nor do we know what to do. You want to talk about total despair? No idea how to handle this. No way. There's not a clue. And then he says this, but our eyes are upon you. This guy doesn't move. He doesn't fall. He's looking at an impossible situation where his life is on the line. They're coming to kill him. He doesn't move and with, allow that fear to control him, to control his actions to where instead, uh, where, where he's, he's actually responding to fear rather than responding in faith and trusting in God. He humbles himself. He waits upon the Lord. Verse 13. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Yehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly, in verse 15. And he said, listen, all of you of Judah, and you inhabitants of Yushalayim, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Can you imagine hearing those, that there's no other words you want to hear in the midst of an impossible situation where you're basically condemned to death, then the battle is not yours, it's God's. And why do you want to hear that? God can't lose. No matter what battle he fights, he comes out on top, he will win. He cannot lose. And so this is what he says, that the Lord is stepping into this situation. In verse 17, you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the Yeshua. That's in Hebrew. Yeshua, stand and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. What an amazing insight. Oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And if the Lord is with us, who can be against us? Nothing. Nothing can stand against us if, in fact, the Lord is with us. Verse 20. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out... Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe as prophets, and you shall prosper. Believe. What is it saying when it says believe in his prophets? Believe in his word. This is telling us how to prosper. We either believe it or we don't. We cannot prosper unless we believe Cannot happen. You believe that the word has become flesh and has dwelt among us. You believe that the written word of God is truth. It is wisdom. It's more powerful than a sharp and living than a sharper and two-edged sword. Amen. That's what it is. Moving on to verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. What kookballness is this? 
point people to sing to the Lord who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Hodu le'odonai ki le'olam chasdo. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now you have to appreciate the context. You have to get into this, into the historical context of literally watching this happen. Hey guys, I got a great idea. We're going against war, against the army. We don't stand a chance. They're going to slaughter us. But I have a great idea. Let's put singers out in front. Could you imagine the American armies today, the Marines going forth and putting a bunch of boy bands and saying, hey, we're going to go. And we're going to war against whoever, whether it's Russia or China, whatever the deal is. And we're going to put these, oh, these boy bands. This is a great idea. And you guys go first and sing, and this is how we're going to fight this war. We'd be the laughing stock of the world. We'd look absurd. In this situation, they put the singers first because what they declared gave them victory, gave them the battle. They were not to fight the battle. The battle was the Lord. So these three, they go out. Hodu le'eronai ki le'olam chasdo. You want to see how powerful this is? You want to see how powerful that statement is? It gets so much deeper than what we see. And I want to point this out. So it says, Hodu, Laodonai, praise the Lord. His mercy, Hasdo. His mercy. In other words, his grace. His loving kindness. His, and the, the word is chesed. What do we know about Yeshua. You go to the New Testament, there's this unbelievable revelation. For example, in Titus 2.11. But now, the grace of God has been revealed, Paul says. Has been revealed to all men. The grace that brings salvation has been revealed. Now you think about that. All the apostles and these righteous men in the New Testament, they saw something. They said, we've actually seen. We know who the mercy of God is. We know the grace of God. He actually became tangible and dwelt among us. His name is Yeshua. And so they're literally going out, putting the singers first, and they're declaring the son of the living God. Praise the Lord because of his mercy, because of his son, because of Yeshua. This is what wins the victory. This is what wins the battle, but he gets better than this. Notice what it says right at the end. His mercy endures forever. Forever, that is an aspect you will. I'm going to tell you right now, you will not read the Tanakh the same way again because we see this throughout the Hebrew Bible, especially in the Psalms. That his mercy endures forever. I want to take you to Revelation. I want to show you something, and it ties in here just unbelievably. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Look at this. Praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. This is what he is saying. Yeshua lives forever. He is forevermore. He has no limitations. You will not stop him. Total victory. This is what we're seeing in this battle. So we have all these amazing elements of how to gain victory. And you remember what we talked about in, in, in uh, uh, John with chapter 14? Right? In John chapter 14, whatever you ask in my name, believing that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I mean, all these elements of prayer to be successful are in this story and fasting. Moving on to verse 22. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. An impossible situation now becomes possible, and it all started with praying and fasting. Humble heart, faith, faith in his mercy, that is forever. Yeshua lives forever. He will never end. That's our guarantee. The power is in the resurrection. Amen? I'm going to close with this. A story in the Gospel of Mark to show you how powerful praying and fasting really is. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought to you my son, and he, uh, ha, who, has, who has a mute spirit, and, whoever, and whenever, wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. They couldn't do it. 
And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And when they bring him to him, Yeshua casts it out. It was nothing. He casts out this thing. Now, here's what's interesting. The, the, the disciples who have cast out demons, who have been doing ministry, they're completely perplexed. What is going on here? And so we read in verse 28. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind cannot come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Do you understand? When you are confronted with the most extreme situations, when you come up against the strongest demons of hell, you are going to need hell-shaking prayer and fasting. This is how we overcome these things. Do you understand how important prayer and fasting is? It should make you desire it. Know your flesh is going to flip out and it's going to hate you. Now you know you're walking the walk and you're walking in the spirit when your flesh is going and doing that to you. And so I'm going to close here uh, for today.